C Sharp 10 and .NET 6 are released. And in this video, I want to show you new features we can use in our applications. However, I don't just want to talk about those features. I want to take an existing real world .NET Core 3.1 ASP.NET Web API project and turn it into a modern .NET 6 application. The goal is to showcase the new .NET 6 features and provide a starting point for everyone interested in migrating their applications. Now let's jump into Visual Studio and take a look at the application. The application we will refactor into a modern .NET 6 application is a small ASP.NET Core Web API backend for an Android app I wrote years ago. It has the ideal size for a video like this. The solution contains two projects. First, we have the ASP.NET Web API application. The application traditionally has a program and a startup class. We also have two controllers and a backend module class. In the project settings, we can see that the application targets .NET Core 3.1. The second project in this solution is a class library that contains data and parsers. It's the backend business logic and we're not going to look into that project. However, the class library targets .NET Standard 1.3. Let's start the application. The browser opens at the API slash cities slash to route, which returns a list of cities as an XML response. As we saw in the solution explorer before, a second route also returns XML data. The data itself is not important, but I hope this demo helps to understand the simple use case this backend solves. Now that we know about the application structure, let's change the target framework to .NET 6. First, we open the project settings for the backend project. In the drop down menu, we select .NET 6 as the target framework for the project and save the file. By the way, if you're using Visual Studio, make sure to install Visual Studio 2022 when you want to upgrade your projects to .NET 6. Also, make sure to install the .NET 6 SDK. If you want to have an overview of .NET 6, C Sharp 10 and Visual Studio 2022, and how they relate to each other, watch the video I recently uploaded to this channel if you haven't already. Next, we want to also change the target framework for the class library. We could do it the same way and open the project file in Visual Studio. However, I want to show you how to do it when editing the project file with a text editor. It comes in handy if you have a large resolution and want to change the target framework of multiple projects. In the project file, we change the content of the target framework property to net 6.0 and save the file. Let's clean and rebuild the application. We can also start the application and again see that it still works. Luckily the application we're migrating is very simple and only uses basic types that do not have any breaking changes. Therefore, the build is successful without applying any code changes. If it were the only goal to compile this application using the new .NET 6 SDK, we would already be at the end. However, I want to take the opportunity and refactor and modernize the application to make it simpler. In the process, we will also make use of new C Sharp 10 features. Stick with me until the end to see if there are new C Sharp 10 features you want to use in your applications. Let's start by removing Autofact from the application. To be honest, I can't remember why I decided to use Autofact for this simple application 5 years ago. If I were to start a simple project like this today, I'd definitely use the internal dependency injection container that ASP.NET Core applications offer. I open the backend module class that contains the registrations. We can see that we only have two registrations. I copy the content of the class over into the startup.cs file. In the configure services method, I insert the definitions and rewrite them using the add singleton method to fit the API of the iService collection type. Now let's delete the backend module class in the solution explorer. Next, we want to open the NuGet package manager for the backend project. We uninstall both Autofact packages and build the solution. We get a few errors that we can fix by removing the autofact related code. We build the application again and start it to see if it still works without autofact. As you can see, it works. 
In the NuGet package manager, I saw that we have a reference to a code generation package. I don't think we need that anymore and uninstall it too. If you have dependencies in your application, I highly recommend updating the installed NuGet packages after changing the target framework to .NET 6. Also make sure to remove any packages that you don't need anymore, as we did for this application. With those changes out of the way, let's finally start using c 10 and .NET 6 features. Up to .NET 5, the traditional way to start an ASP.NET Core application was to have a program and a startup class. The new minimal hosting model introduced in .NET 6 simplifies the process by combining it into a single program.cs file. Let's take a quick look at the program.cs file that gets generated when creating a new project using the default project template in Visual Studio 2022 for an ASP.NET Core application. We see several new features in this file. Top-level statements introduced in c 9, implicit global usings introduced in c 10, and the new web application builder introduced in .NET 6. First of all, we see that we have a single file with the application builder on the first line and the service registrations starting on line 5. Below, we define the HTTP request pipeline, which had its own method in a traditional startup class. I show you a quick side-by-side -side comparison to make it easy to understand where the different parts went. Now that we understand the minimal hosting model, we want to refactor our application to make use of it. We open the program and the startup.cs files side by side. In the startup file, we have a lot of boilerplate code and the service registrations. In the program file, we only have the project setup referencing the startup class. Let's clear the program file and start from scratch. Let's define a builder variable and initialize it using the web application.createBuilder method. We import the Microsoft.ASP.NET Core.Builder namespace. Next, we build the builder and assign the result to the app variable. Next, we set up the application by registering the controllers using the builder.services.addController's method. After that, we copy our service registrations from the startup file and change the code to match the new API. We also need to import additional namespaces. Next, we configure the HTTP request pipeline by adding the use HTTPS redirection and the map controllers method. Last but not least, we call the app.run method to start the configured application. Now let's take a look at the startup class. The use routing configuration isn't required for the minimal hosting model. We use the map controllers method that also handles the routing. We don't need to configure the developer exception page explicitly. Using the minimal hosting model, the developer exception page gets automatically configured if we run the application in the development environment. The endpoint registration is done by the map controllers method and the use HTTPS redirection method remains the same using the new hosting model. Now let's close and delete the startup file. We build and run the application. And as you can see, the application still returns the same XML response. Global Usings is a new c 10 feature that allows us to group using statements in a single place in the project. We define a global using in a single file and the namespaces are available in every file in the project. The goal is to minimize the clutter at the beginning of every file when we import many of the system and Microsoft namespaces. Because projects tend to use the same default namespaces, Microsoft came up with implicit global usings. Implicit global usings is a feature that we can enable in the project file. Let's open the backend.cs project file and add the implicit usings property with the value enabled. Let's take a look at the program file. We can now remove two of the using statements because there are global using statements for those namespaces. Let's go through the other files in the project and clean up all using statements. But where are the generated global using statements? Great question! 
Let's open an explorer and navigate to the project folder. The implicit global using statements are in a file prefixed with the project name and followed by a .globalusings.g.cs. You can find the file in the object slash debug slash net6.o folder of your project. Newly created projects targeting .NET 6 will have this option enabled by default. So if you start new projects and don't want this feature, you need to disable it in the project file. Another interesting new c 10 feature is file scope namespaces. Let's open the Cities controller class. We have the namespace definition on line 5 and every definition within this namespace is indented and enclosed by a block using braces. If we click on the namespace keyword, Visual Studio 2022 offers a quick fix to convert the namespace definition into a file scope namespace definition. Let's do it. As you can see, the namespace definition is now a single statement ending with a semicolon like most other C -sharp instructions. If you use file scope namespaces, you can only have a single namespace per file. However, I think that 99.9% .9 of all C# files I have ever seen only use a single namespace. You also notice that the class definition now starts as the outermost definition in the file and is not indented. Let's do the same for the Parkings controller class. Another big feature introduced in ASP.NET Core using .NET 6 is minimal APIs. When creating a new project, you can choose if you want to generate a traditional project using controllers or if you want to create a project using minimal APIs. The application we are refactoring here is an excellent example of a minimal API project. It only has two small controllers with one endpoint each and we don't need advanced features like action filters. We only want to return data when the API gets called. Let's refactor our application to use minimal APIs. Let's open the cities controller side by side with the program file. We remove the map controllers configuration call in the program file because we want to define the endpoints using minimal APIs instead of the controllers. Next, we add an endpoint using the map get method. The first argument is the endpoint definition using the known parameter syntax. The second parameter is a handler method which gets called when the API is executed. We define the ID we receive when the endpoint is called and we copy and paste the implementation from the cities controller. Let's close the cities controller file. Next we want to use the city repository on line 18. We can inject the service to the handler of the minimal API by adding a second parameter to the handler method. When the handler is called, an object from the services collection will be provided. Let's import the missing namespaces and run the application. As you can see, we get the same result but a different representation in the browser. In this application, we return XML which is not supported by default. The content result object doesn't work with minimal APIs. Let's fix it by inserting a code snippet. I defined an XML result type that implements the iResult interface accepting a string in the constructor. In the method defined by the interface, we set the content type to application slash XML and use a memory stream to convert the XML content and copy it to the response body. We also define an extension method that allows us to conveniently use the XML result object in our API. Let's replace the return statement. We use the results.extensions.xml method and provide the XML data. Next, I insert the second endpoint definition and delete the controllers folder in the solution explorer. We start the application and we have a working XML response for both endpoints. Last but not least, we have some code application that we can get rid of here. I insert a snippet with an XML result builder class. Next, we refactor the code to use the XML result builder to create the XML responses in both endpoints. Let's take a look at the final result of the project. We have a single file defining two endpoints. 
With all the new .NET 6 and C Sharp 10 features we used in this project, we reduced the files and lines of code a lot. Please let me know what you think about the new features and what features you will use in your projects. If you haven't already, I highly suggest watching the .NET 6 overview video and the Visual Studio 2022 video on this channel. If you got any value out of this video, please drop a like and if you want to see more, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and see you in the next.